The drug industry is making record profits during a time when more patients are dying from their defective products. See the story at DrugSafetyNews.com. It's great to have back on the program attorney Mike Papantonio, co-host of Ring of Fire. Pap, you know, when you think of baby powder, you think of one of the least offensive, just least dangerous, most innocuous substances, right? Talc. But as we've learned over the last 12 hours, a number of reports about the $72 million order for Johnson & Johnson to pay out, uh, you, you would be very wrong if you think there's nothing to worry about with baby powder. Well, you know, this is, this is a case really of great lawyering, David. The, the, the lawyer who handled this case, Jerry Beasley, uh, is just, he, he's, he's been a trial lawyer, you know, what, 50 years. And the, it, it's the kind of case that he typically does handle where everybody else looks at it and says, I can't imagine that baby powder has the ability to kill people. Jerry Beasley jumped in. And he tried this case in, in, in Missouri, St. Louis, Missouri. What he knew was that, that the, inter, the International Journal of Gynecological Cancer had reported, uh, uh, is 2015, they start reporting the fact that there seems to be a, a 30 to 60 percent increase in ovarian cancer for women who use this either shower to shower or Johnson Johnson baby powder, powder on a regular basis. And so what he started doing was putting the connections together. Uh, you know, what they were finding, they were actually finding fibrous minerals in the tumors that were being, re that were being removed from, from women's ovaries. And the questions then were, well, what, what kind of powder do you use? And it came up, it was Johnson & Johnson, it was shower to shower, and it's a silica powder. And so we learned an awful lot about silica powder doing the asbestos cases. The reason we're handling these cases is because we want women to understand, stop using the stuff, put it away. There's no reason to even take a chance on something like this, because right now the, the, uh, the, uh, the information to me is becoming overwhelming. And it's, it started as early as the 1980s with uh, Johnson & Johnson understanding that there was a potential risk here. And this is one particular case, right? $72 million to the family of a woman whose death from ovarian cancer was specifically linked to her use of Johnson & Johnson talc-based baby powder. But now, as we're getting more and more reports, it seems that there may be, may be up to a thousand other cases linking talcum powder to cancer, which have been filed in Missouri state court. What do you know about those thousand well, roughly the, other cases? Yeah. The, those cases are a, a lawyer is not going to file an ovarian cancer case that they don't have some causal relationship between between the Johnson and Johnson or shower to shower. There's no there's no benefit in that lawyer filing a case unless they've done their due diligence and unless they see there's a relationship between uh, at least from a temporal relationship between the women, women, women using this powder and then the onset of the ovarian cancer. Obviously, the, the thing that you're able to do with the pathology in these cases is actually find remnants of the mineral. And, and, and we look at the asbestos cases, we could find the actual asbestos mineral inside the human body. Here you're able to find with good pathology that's, that's, that's successful, you're able to find the actual mineral inside the, the, the tumors that are grown in these women's body. So just the notion that, gee whiz, there's a thousand cases filed, you can bet that most of those cases, there has been due diligence done, there's been a finding of some relationship between the talcum powder and the ovarian cancer. And so, um, of course, Johnson & Johnson will play this out uh, as if, gee, this is just a fishing expedition. Well, it's not. Johnson & Johnson understood as early as, as I say, the 1980s that there was a direct relationship here that they were, that they were concerned about. And they didn't tell the FDA and, because they're not actually, they're not, uh, they're not regulated by the FDA, which is amazing. It's a self-regulating decision that Johnson & Johnson had to make. They didn't share it with the FDA because they, had, they say they had no responsibility to do that, which is technically correct. But they, they didn't even share it with customers without putting any kind of warning on the product at all that there may be a relationship between ovarian cancer and the use of this product. And correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, there has been a change in what goes into talcum powder. I mean, before the 1970s, 
you often had these asbestos fibers, which oh, yeah. are obviously widely known to cause cancer that would be, would be in talcum powder. In the, under EU law, anyway, any home product that contains talcum powder now is legally obliged to be asbestos free. But now the question seems to be about the talcum powder itself, right? And the idea that the talc could irritate ovaries in a way that could eventually cause inflammation. And as we know, inflammation is what leads to cancer. So even though many were under the impression, oh, this was sort of solved in the 1970s, now it appears that that may not be the case. Well, that's right. I mean, if you take a look at, uh, you, first of all, you have to understand that there, there are potential defendants in this case that are, the, that are mining this stuff. Okay, they're mining it just like they would mine asbestos. And when you dig into the ground and you get a mineral, and this mineral has the ability to, uh, at, at a, uh, uh, t to cause irritation, you, you can develop something called a scar-based cancer. It, it is, as you pointed out, it's, it's typically related to the inflammation that comes from a foreign body being in human tissue. And so that's, and when you're able to say, look, we saw the tumor, and inside the tumor was this material, um, you know, it, it's a pretty good relationship that you can, uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty good causal relationship that you're able to draw. And that's what Jerry Beasley did in this case. But, you know, David, this is, th there's another story here. The other story is this is another case where the company failed to police themselves. The regulators were completely asleep at the wheel. The media never bought into this story because it's Johnson & Johnson baby powder. And they're advertising for Johnson & Johnson every day. And they, they certainly don't want to go with, forward with a story like this. This story has been kicking around for some time. But it was one of those stories that the media refused to talk about. It's like the story that we have up in, uh, uh, up in Ohio with C8, where the C8's causing cancer to thousands and thousands of people. It, but the media wouldn't talk about it uh, because DuPont was such a big advertiser. And this is, this is exactly that situation. Johnson & Johnson is a massive advertiser. The story's been kicking around a long time. But Jerry had the, uh, had, had, had the guts to go forward with it and do what the media wouldn't do, what the regulators wouldn't do, what the industry wouldn't do, and that is to, to, to say, look, women, don't take any risks. Stop using it. And I, I think that's why we're convinced to, to go forward with these cases. We're going to be handling these cases in a, in a big kind of way because we feel like uh, the more you're able to tell people Stop using this stuff. The more often you can do that, the better results you're going to get. There's no reason to use Johnson & Johnson or shower-to-shower -shower baby powder. There simply is no reason. And isn't the, the sort of broader story here, and, and you're sort of alluding to it, right? I mean, the idea that a company or organization knows about a risk and they do nothing about it, right? We have now, we're, we're talking about Johnson & Johnson and baby powder. Of course, you've been working the Teflon case involving DuPont. We now know even at, the, at a broader scale on climate change, ExxonMobil dating back four to five decades knew about the impact of fossil fuel mining and transportation and usage about the impact on the environment. They did nothing to curb that. This is sort of the broader story you're alluding to, isn't it? Well, it is. At some point, you know, David, what has to happen is it has to be more than social media reporters like me and like you talking and talking about these stories. Uh, corporate media has to do their job. They have to say there's a Chinese wall between the advertising end of what we do and the news end of what we do. And that has to happen. Now, for example, the, the, the story that you're talking about here, if, if I'm in the Department of Justice and I'm looking at the documents that show that, that uh, of what these oil companies did, where they actually undertook a strategy to lie to regulators, to lie to the American public, and they understood while they were lying that they were killing our planet. What they were doing, if, in, in a sense, is nothing less than manslaughter, David. I mean, they, it's, not their, it's not them. They're not going to suffer. It's, it's your grandchildren. It's your children who are going to have to face the catastrophic events that are going to unfold in the next decades because of their criminal conduct. But nevertheless... The only people that have, the only only group that has seriously looked at this has been the New York Attorney General because our Department of Justice is so frigging second class, and there there are white collar criminals that should be going to jail for some of these decisions. But uh, we, we see it every day. I see it with pharmaceutical cases. 
uh, the case that we're going to be handling here with uh, the talcum powder. When we start looking at it, we, we, I'd like to know who knew what when. You know, these, these are big questions that have to be answered. And, and Jerry, Jerry has already shown that there's a very good connection already about what, what Johnson & Johnson knew, when they should have done something, and their failure to do it because they wanted to make a profit. That is the scenario that plays out day after day in our business. And David, thank you for reporting it. Because if it weren't for social media reporters like you, these stories would never, never get legs. The DuPont story is a great example. You started reporting on it, somebody else picked it up. The Intercept picks it up. Uh, Huffington Post picks it up. Uh, uh, magazine after magazine, environmental magazine picks it up. But it has to begin with what people like you are doing at the very basic level of social media. Well, we'll be doing it. You'll be working the case, and we'll certainly be covering it. We've been speaking with attorney Mike Papantonio, co-host of Ring of Fire. Thanks, as always, for being on. Thank you, David.